you so much for joining us to the architect career panel of the SIMA group. We're very, very eager to get started and so happy to have you all here. Um, yeah, this is something that we introduced actually um, as part of uh, one of our hosts, Yayesh. He, it was such a good idea and it's so hectic. So I really like this idea. So if it's okay with you guys, let's take a pause for one minute, just breathe for 60 seconds and then we can get started. I didn't have a timer, so I hope that was 60 seconds. <laughs> okay, more or less, good enough. So um, I'm really happy to have you guys here as part of the SIMA group. So um, the leadership team of the SIMA group is Neha, who as mentioned, unfortunately cannot join today. Um, Mira, who has joined, so I'm really, really happy she's here. Uh, and myself, of course, we have huge su support from Johan and Gaurav as well. So they never put themselves on this slide, but they're there very actively in the background. All right. And we have a great panel, of course. So um, we're joined today by Doina, by Ben Duncombe, uh, Aryan, Steve, Susanna. So I don't want to spend too much time on what your current roles are and what you do, because actually I want to have you discuss it and <laughs> enlighten us on how you got there too. So I will just jump into the house rules and what we want to achieve. So um, we're just a group of people who are going for the CTA um, and all forms of architects being in Salesforce uh, in the ecosystem. So we just want to gather interesting people, get their thoughts, get their knowledge and share it with everyone else. Um, but of course, yeah, we are not affiliated with Salesforce. Anything we say is personal opinion, of course. So yeah, don't follow our advice necessarily, make your own choices and check. During the call, please, of course, not for the panelists, but everyone else, please mute. Um, you can ask any questions in the chat, so we will be monitoring that one. Um, and yeah, if there's something that goes wrong, we'll try to fix it. It's, of course, a live event, so things can go wrong. And yeah, if you are interested in hosting or presenting, do reach out to us later on. We're always eager to have new talent join us. Okay, so let's get to the actual panel and make some introductions. So Doina, can you introduce yourself and tell us how you got where you were? Sure, I'll try to not make it too long so I don't bore everyone. Um, <laughs> first of all, very nice to be here. Thank you for organizing the event. Very nice to be together with uh, quite a few people I know and to see each other again and to talk to you all. Um, congratulations if you are on your CTE journey like Lilith and studying hard for it as I know she does. Uh, so all the best with uh, that. Um, now to go to myself, uh, I'm Doina Popa at the moment. Um, so I'm a CTA, um, was um, fortunate enough to get it uh, a while back. Um, I currently wear two hats. Uh, so I went on the entrepreneurial path and started my uh, Salesforce uh, consulting company actually when COVID hit. So that was a nice experience. Um, which is called InnoTrue. So <laughs> my consulting company is called InnoTrue. Uh, and uh, what, I, what happened in the meantime after I uh, set up the company was I discovered another super interesting company that I decided I wanted to join um, and work with them and for them. Uh, and that is UiPath. And that's where I am the head of revenue technology um, at the moment. So I'm leading a team of, um, I'm leading a team there. Um, in terms of my Salesforce journey, I started about 11 years ago. I discovered Salesforce accidentally in a way. So I just had started reading about it a little bit um, in, the, uh, in technology articles. And then I um, was offered a job in Salesforce. 
Um, I was initially um, uh, a Java programmer, then did product management, project management, business uh, management. But then I decided when I discovered Salesforce to go really from the beginning uh, and to learn kind of ground up uh, everything about the Salesforce platform. So I started as a consultant and as a developer slash admin doing little support tasks, learned my way through. Um, eventually I started getting certifications, joined Salesforce where I worked for five years as a program architect, which was really uh, a great experience and helped me learn a lot. Uh, this is the time when I also uh, achieved my uh, CTA um, and where I met one of the other panelists, uh, Aryan. Uh, we were colleagues then. Um, then I decided to move away from Salesforce and to pursue other interesting uh, areas. So I joined Capgemini as the CTO of their Salesforce practice in the UK which was very interesting. I got to see how it is on the systems integrator side and how the heavy lifting is done. Um, and then um, I uh, moved to Barclays, which is a one of the largest banks in the world. Um, I was the CIO for their Salesforce practice. That was very interesting because I got to experience what it is to be a customer of Salesforce and how you manage everything from the relationship with Salesforce to team of delivery, to management of partners, vendors, and of course the internal stakeholders. So that was very interesting. And after having those experiences, the only other exciting thing I could think about was founding my own company. And this is how Inotru was born. That is quite a journey with so many different hats, which I think is very, very inspiring to a lot of people here who are maybe finding the right hat for them. So yeah, thanks so much for that introduction. And yeah, I'm really, really ha happy to have you here and um, eager to start asking questions. But first, let's go to the next person of our panel, Arjen. You were already slightly introduced by Doina, but still. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so hey, uh, my name is Arjen Kramer. I'm, uh, uh, I live in the Netherlands together with my wife and uh, three beautiful daughters. Um, I uh, started my career, well, actually, I, I was this and I wanted to become a fighter pilot, but that it didn't work out. So then uh, I seek something else and uh, looked at uh, what I liked uh, best next to that. And that was technology. So I started um, my uh, uh, study studies in ele electronics and then specifically uh, the telco uh, in Informatica uh, area. And that um, introduced me into programming and anything that had to do with software. So then uh, um, uh, started my career at uh, Capgemini, uh, moved from software engineer all the way to uh, solution architect. Um, and the last uh, years there uh, really uh, did large transformational uh, um, uh, programs with uh, uh, organizations like, for instance, uh, Liberty Global, uh, IKEA, uh, Deutsche Post. So um, focusing uh, primarily on digital customer experience, that part of the uh, digital transformation piece. Um, then moved to Salesforce, uh, joined Salesforce um, a little over five years ago, um, was my first introduction really into Salesforce. Uh, up until th that moment, I only, only saw that single overview slide and uh, the people that have been around in Salesforce land know it, the circle, uh, the circular diagram that showed all of the uh, yeah, pieces of, of the, the Salesforce uh, platform back then. So talking uh, six, seven years ago. Um, so it was uh, quite a, a steep ramp. And yes, Doina uh, was one of the people really helping me out. Uh, my first days at, uh, at Salesforce, getting to know the, um, the, the product, but also the organization and the, 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 yeah, the ecosystem around it. So uh, really thankful still. Um, yeah, I guess then um, a little, yeah, like uh, 21 months, uh, roughly uh, later, I actually passed the uh, CTA uh, review board. Um, so that was uh, quite a ramp also uh, uh, working towards that. But uh, one thing uh, actually made me realize, um, maybe even uh, mostly after I, I uh, passed the CTA review board, was that um, it is 
definitely also about whether you know details of, uh, about the sales of technology, but also about, yeah, uh, can you be an enterprise level architect? So uh, I think that's roughly highlights of, uh, of me and uh, my career so far. Thanks so much. And I'm very, very happy you did not become a firefighter because <laughs> you are one of the people who really pointed me in the right direction, introduced me to so many interesting other people. So for me personally, maybe a loss for the military, but definitely a win for me. So <laughs> thanks, Aryan. <laughs> Okay, and then someone I have never met in person until now, but who, whose voice I've heard many, many times while listening to his podcast. So Ben, could you introduce yourself, please, as well? I sure can. Thank you very much for, uh, for having me. So I guess I'm the odd one out because I'm not a, a Salesforce architect. Um, I'm a Salesforce recruiter. I've been recruiting in the Salesforce ecosystem for about six years now. Um, prior to that, I used to recruit in the SAP world, and I found that really, really boring. Um, so it was a, a, a breath of fresh air coming into the Salesforce world. Um, I have placed lots of Salesforce professionals over the last six or so years, um, and actually only two certified technical architects in all of that time. Um, but I obviously speak to a lot of architects. I speak to a lot of aspiring architects. And, and as you mentioned, I have a podcast where I, I'm really fascinated in, in speaking to all of the different personalities and skill sets and um, everyone from across the ecosystem and, uh, and really learning about the journeys that people are on. So, um, yeah, thanks for having me. Really excited to be involved. Yeah, thank you so much for being here. And yeah, another person who I haven't really met in real life until now, Susanna, but who I've also heard speak a lot in videos from Ladies Be Architect and many, many more. So, so happy to have you here too, Susanna. Please introduce yourself. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Um, it's a pleasure to be here this morning, this afternoon, this evening, whatever time zone you're in. Um, just a brief overview, I guess, of my career. Uh, it's a little bit different from some of the folks who've spoke already, um, both from my destination where I am now and also where it started. Uh, but I started my uh I don't know, I, I started my career, you could say, in nonprofits. I was um, working for um, a, a music nonprofit, so a performing arts organization. Um, I studied music in college. That's what I thought I was going to be doing. I thought I would be performing in an orchestra somewhere in 2021. But uh, as it turns out, life had something a little bit different in store for me. Um, and I fell into Salesforce like a lot of folks do. Uh, I was managing uh, an operations team that happened to use Salesforce to manage fundraising and volunteerism and um, really fell in love with the platform. This was around nine years ago at the time. Um, so started, you know, back in the day, way before Lightning, before the Trailblazer community, before a lot of this. Um, but taught myself uh, how to build reports and do all the key sort of admin functions that you need to do to, to use Salesforce for a nonprofit. And um, over time, I found myself moving jobs a couple of times, working for larger and larger nonprofits and realizing that while Salesforce was always a part of my role, uh, I constantly wanted it to be a bigger part of my role. So I, over time, had less and less time doing fundraising, which was part of what I was uh, supposed to be doing, and doing more and more Salesforce work. And eventually, I made the jump to uh, work in an IT department. I was hired as a business analyst at a large um, Fortune 500 company, Boston Scientific, for those of you who might be familiar with it. Uh, and spent a number of years working for Boston Scientific and rose from business analyst to a technical lead where I was managing a team of developers and admins and doing a lot of um, implementation work myself, delivery work myself, and um, eventually was promoted to a position of technical architect there where I was then managing a team of technical leads who were managing developers and, and admins. Um, and most recently, before my previous move, I had the great opportunity of, instead of working on the customer side of uh, the, the house, I had the opportunity to work at uh, an ISV partner uh, called Odiseva, 
that focuses on data privacy and protection and data governance and uh, had a wonderful experience there. Learned a lot about what it's like to be on that side, right? Instead of customer working as a partner and just got the opportunity to dig, dig deep on those topics of data governance and privacy um, and protection. And um, out of that role had the amazing opportunity to uh, join Salesforce doing uh, what is what tended to be my recreational job as Lilith sort of hinted at. Um, I had been quite involved in the community, putting out content for folks that were studying for different certifications and doing things like that. And um, one of my favorite things to do is to sort of take technical, maybe things that are hard for folks to digest, especially if they're like me, not coming from a technical background um, and explain it in, in a way that I understand it. And as it turns out, in a way that some other folks can understand it as well that might not be able to just read read the docs and totally absorb it. So my role currently at Salesforce is as a lead evangelist of architect relations. And that's all about translating the work that is happening at Salesforce and disseminating it out into the community, uh, making sure that it's you know easy to understand, that it's relevant to architects and um, really uh, evangelizing the Salesforce platform. So it's truly uh, a dream opportunity. I think it's a great fit. I've been there all of three weeks. Uh, you can ask me about, about my opinion in three years, but but um, right now I'm very happy for, uh, you know, where my career has led me so far. So thank you. Yeah, thanks so much. And thanks again for everything that you have put out in the community. I think for a lot of people, it has been really, really, yeah, they're stepping stones into these complex materials. And also someone else who is helping people grasp complex uh, concepts is, of course, Steve Baines. In, um, yeah, of course, you have the CTA office hours where you advise people on um, how, get, how they can implement Salesforce, but also, of course, you're a CTA instructor for 901, and luckily for me, also 902. <laughs> yes, I'm actually teaching 901 in a couple hours. I've been doing that this week. Um, so uh, Steve Baines, as Lois said, um, been in the Salesforce ecosystem since 2004, started as a customer. I actually started my career wanting to be a physician. Uh, that's what I went to school for, um, for pre-med. Uh, life kind of took over. I actually, I was a father at 18 years old and um, had to drop out of college after a couple of years. So decided to join the United States Air Force as a medic. My plan was to finish my education there and then move on to medical school. Um, fortunately, I learned uh, uh, during my tenure in the Air Force that um, I would have actually missed my children growing up if I had gone to medical school. So it was a pretty eye-opening experience for me. So I decided to leave the Air Force and uh, pursue a career in tech. So as I said, you know, to, got my first uh, job using Salesforce in 2004. I didn't even know what Salesforce was. And that company I was working for got acquired by uh, Dell Computer a few years later. And I actually had parlayed that into my first consulting gig. So I've actually been doing uh, system integrator work since 2008. Um, had a, built that company up, ended up selling that company to a local digital marketing agency, uh, did that for about a couple of years. And then I spun back out into my latest endeavor, um, Forcivity. So it basically has been a 13 year continuum of doing that type of work. Uh, I'm a CTA. I became a CTA in 2018, back when we actually could do review boards in person. So looking forward to being able to do those again. Um, I had the pleasure of being a CTA review board judge as well. And as Lilith uh, mentioned, I, uh, I teach the Architect 901 and 902 classes, uh, as well as the CTA 601 workshop and the six, uh, CTA 602 readiness assessment as well. So uh, I really, really love to do that type of stuff. So I think that's probably going to be my, the next step in my career. Great to hear because you do it in a wonderful way. So thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thank you. So, <laughs> so let's dive in. Um, I already mentioned in the beginning that I wanted to dive into kind of like what is a Salesforce architect? And um, I know that someone who will have a very interesting perspective on this no doubt is Susanna because you worked for more of the data architect type 
um, company. So I, yeah, what, what do you see as a Salesforce architect? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think that there's not just, right, there's not just one type of architect or Salesforce architect. Um, there's lots of different flavors, lots of different roles. And I think sometimes titles, right, titles vary drastically from company to company as well. But at, at its core, I would say there's um, you know, solution architects who are focused on the Salesforce platform itself, building a solid solution using the Salesforce tools that are available. Um, and then from just a functional perspective, there are also technical architects who are involved with sort of the end outside the ends of the Salesforce platform. So doing things like integration and um, being concerned with how Salesforce interfaces with the other, uh, other pieces of the tech stack that are involved at a particular company, because we all know that while Salesforce is great, it's never the only platform that exists inside uh, a company's uh, IT department, right? Uh, Arjan also mentioned enterprise architects. So again, these are just big high level sort of buckets, but enterprise architects, especially at the customers that I've, that I worked at um, are more involved, less, less concerned about Salesforce and more involved with how all of the systems at a particular company uh, are, are connected and how um, data flows between all of those systems and more of that truly 30,000 foot view. Um, but sort of across all of those, before I close out, across all of those different architect roles, you know, there's lots of different titles, lots of different flavors that I didn't mention, but I think similar across all the roles is the fact that architects are problem solvers um, and think have to think about the big picture, sort of like I mentioned, 30,000 foot view down to the details. Um, when I was working at a customer, you know, I was sort of the final point of uh, escalation. If a developer had a question that no one else could answer on the team, it ended up going to me. So going from that high level view down to, down to the ground and switching, sort of context switching, I think is a common uh, trait, common job. Uh, uh, the moon, the Alps, the curbside, I love that. Um, yeah, Arjun, definitely uh, be able to context switch like crazy. Um, and yeah, I'll leave it at that. I'm sure others have lots of insight to add as well. Yeah, so I'm... I, what I see is there that you get in touch with a lot of different people and based on that you have certain specialities and the, putting a label on it is always difficult. So um, I'm interested, Doina, what uh, is your take on, on this? Do you agree with Susanna that you, know, you have these kind of flavors and what then defines for you an architect? Sure, I totally agree with uh, Susanna's kind of description of the types of architects. Um, maybe I'll just to not be repetitive, um, from my perspective, um, if I think of an architect, I think of someone who can also do uh, stakeholder management, communication, who can really understand together with the customer and sometimes, uh, and uh, Aya knows quite often, uh, challenging even the customer to their best interest. So understanding where they're trying to get to, what's their goal, uh, how and then translating that into how can you actually make that happen and support that business vision, right? So to me, an architect is someone who has also that ability to Ian's point uh, about all of those levels, right? To go from very high up and have those conversations at any level within an organization, all the way to the details of how something should be implemented. Um, and what I'm also, uh, expecting maybe to put it that way from an architect is curiosity, right? So I think as an architect with the pace at which technology is moving at the moment, we just have to keep learning all the time. And uh, for instance, after I got my CTA, I still kept learning and took the other certifications that come later on and still keep up to date with the platform and everything because you have to do that. Otherwise you become, you get out of touch with uh, reality with the platform. So you have to have that kind of curiosity of always understanding uh, more and learning more. And probably the last thing I'll mention is an open mind, right? So try to, um, we of course love Salesforce, right? With all of its components and the platform, 
But like someone mentioned, it's not the only system on the planet, right? So Susanna said, you'll very likely at bigger customers have uh, other systems and even at smaller customers, right? So keep that open mind into understanding, okay, so when does it really make sense to use the Salesforce components? And ideally in lots of places, but what also makes sense from a pragmatic customer's perspective uh, to, um, to think about having a kind of in the broader uh, landscape of the solution I'm building and advising your customer on that. Yeah, thank you so much. And I think one of the interesting elements that you mentioned is also indeed the digital transformation and the new systems which may enter through this. And Ari and I think that this is your forte, right? <laughs> yeah, so I, I think um, uh, definitely all of the above, right? Um, um, end of the day, I think uh, uh, architects are, are the ultimate change agents, if you will. Um, so in, in many cases, uh, like with the CTA, the, the focus is, is obviously heavily on, on solutions and, and digital capabilities, right? But I think um, um, if uh, in today's world, it's always good uh, as an architect also to understand, okay, um, when we're implementing digital capability, there's a change aspect uh, to this as well. Right, a digital transformation is actually about that transformation that you're making as an organization. And yes, it is about new digital capability that you implement, but it's also about the actual change that you want to um, uh, support uh, it with. So um, it, it might be actually impacting a business model or maybe even a really uh, a change of mission for an organization, right? Understanding that, and understanding the core why of an initiative and being able to translate that as an architect into, okay, but then we need to implement uh, this particular uh, digital component. I don't know, uh, maybe uh, a chatbot, um, but also understanding which uh, um, decisions to make, right? Those detailed decisions that you actually make while designing and implementing. Uh, related to that overarching mission that you're on. Uh, that's really uh, the role of the architect. And one thing I, I wanted to mention uh, as well, um, so, the, and, and probably people that uh, uh, feel themselves and in, 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 um, uh, call themselves architect will, will see this, uh, have, will have seen this, right? So typically architects, um, once we get together in offices again, you'll see that, that more and more, but typically those are the people that people gather around the desk, right? So uh, they'll, they'll be talking about maybe showing something on a screen or be, maybe be in front of a whiteboard and, and uh, bring up uh, yeah, certain topics that, that need to be clarified, um, not only for that person individually, but um, in many cases, a team, the entire team needs to be on board and uh, decisions need to be made, right? And that's typically what the architect does, right? Uh, leading those type of engagement within the um, uh, implementation you're in. Yeah, so being able to do to be the problem solver that Susanna mentioned by having this high level view because you know which systems are there and which could enter also yeah. your ecosystem. Exactly. So from my time at uh, Cape Gemini, uh, I was uh, training a, uh, giving a training for solution architects there. And uh, one of the other aspects that we actually mentioned there was uh, being an architectural beacon. So uh, people would uh, more or less gather around uh, that architect, right? And uh, you more or less explain, okay, from the moon, this is what we see. But if we get down to the curbside, right, I know a uh, hey, specialist in X, Y, Z uh, that has impact on, on what you're doing, right? So, and that's being able to make the, those switches exactly uh, like uh, Doina and uh, Susanna already brought in. Yep, absolutely. That's the role of the architect. Yeah, and one thing that you've all mentioned already, and I, I know is also maybe kind of... Um, uh, pet peeve of Steve is, is the communication part. So we always know that, okay, you need to have a strong technical background, but the communication mm -hmm. part will make you succeed or not, right, Steve? Absolutely, yes. And those of you that know me know that I'm a big proponent of soft skills as well. Um, so it's a, a equally as critical component to having those technical skills. Um, you know, because Salesforce has made the technology relatively easy compared to how it used to be even, you know, three or four years ago. 
What's equal as important though, is how do you actually bring organizations through the changes that you're proposing? So focusing on people and processes are, are just as important as giving them sound technical solutions because you certainly can build the best thing in the world, but if folks haven't been trained on it, user adoption will be low, user, user satisfaction will be low, and it just will be an overall, you know, uh, less impactful experience for everybody. So um, I tend to focus a lot on the softer side of Salesforce, so to speak, and you know, specifically with organizational change management to make sure that the solutions that we're proposing are actually implementable for them. That's something that the organization can actually do. Great, thanks so much. And Ben, do you feel that this translates also to the job market? Is this what companies are looking for? Or do they see the value of this role or this group of roles maybe even? Yeah, I think it's interesting um, to Susanna's point about the, the different titles. I think when I first started recruiting in the Salesforce world, you had solution architect and technical architect. Um, and now there's so many, you have integration architect, data architect, program architect. There's all, all of these different architect roles. Um, but fundamentally, I think any architect really in this ecosystem is in demand. Um, and the ones that are most in demand are the ones that can tell a story and can can hold credibility with senior stakeholders and, and take people on that journey. Um, like Steve said, it's not just about knowing the technology, it's being able to articulate that to the right people. Um, and, and they're the people that we see in the most demand that, that have the technical skills, but also the, the soft skills too. Okay, great, thanks. So one of the questions that came in uh, beforehand was being in that position where you have to do a lot of communication actually, and maybe not too much hands-on, how do you still keep in touch with that hands-on knowledge that you need to be able to talk on the, the curbside level? How do you guys manage this? Dona, you mentioned you study a lot, but you know, is that sufficient? How, how are you guys looking at this? Well, maybe I'm a little bit biased here because I come from a technical background. So to me, it's just interesting to, to continue learning about it, right? So, um, but even for, um, even ignoring that, I think um, not only learning and keeping up to date with, by reading what's coming up, but also trying things hands-on, uh, even if you don't have the opportunity anymore, maybe um to work hands-on on uh, code or on a real piece of functionality um the customer side at least uh try hands-on uh, different things and uh see how they work because unless you do that then you won't have the actual uh practical experience of um of those concepts and then it's much more difficult to grasp and the knowledge is not as solid right hmm. Maybe um, uh, a, a bit of an angle to uh, to your point here, Doina. Um, I think at a certain point, right? If you look at the the Salesforce uh, um, uh, ecosystem, right, uh, the the vast amount of products which which is growing, it's also uh, good to understand that as an architect, right. Uh, you have an obligation, more or less, to understand uh, what you still know and what you are able to, uh, uh, yeah, act as an architect on uh, personally, or where you actually need to involve a subject matter expert, right, uh, to actually deep dive. Uh, typically, that's my experience, at least. Uh, you're able to uh, ask the right questions. Right, even to a subject matter expert, uh, but sometimes you actually just just need to ask those right questions to be able to understand uh, will this actually work out in in real life. Um, so um, uh, back to what I mentioned about that uh, solution architect training. What what we uh, typically uh, would uh, visualize this in is is the T shape uh, uh, professional, right? So basically, you come. Everyone comes from a particular expertise area. Um, something that you grew out of. Uh, in some cases, or in many cases, it's actually from a developer background uh, as an architect, but in some cases, it could also be an admin or a more business-oriented um, uh, area where you come from, right? So less focused on, for instance, coding or uh, deep technical skills. Um, that's all right, as long as you uh, are able to understand uh, where your uh, deep expertise is, uh, that uh, um, 
uh, vertical leg of your uh, T uh, and where uh, actually it, it, it uh, fades out uh, to the areas that you don't know um, uh, enough about, right? Um, and knowing that and involving an expert at the right moment in time, I think is one of the crucial things uh, uh, yeah, to be successful as an architect as well. And I love that just to hop in, Arjan, um, the idea of the the T. And I think it's so important to be aware of those gaps. Again, speaking from someone who doesn't come from a developer background, but added on enough of those skills to ask the right questions, to get my hands dirty. I'm not the I'm definitely not the fastest coder in the world. That's an area where I would defer to someone for an implementation to write the, you know, the full code that needs to be done. I can stub stuff out and give an example. Um, but being aware of those areas where you're strong and where maybe you need to build additional skills, I think is uh, an important skill unto itself. Because if you're not recognizing those gaps, then you know you are, aren't improving uh, in, in the ways that you could, especially for those that are pursuing the CTA. I think being really honest, right, about those gaps is, is such an important uh, skill to have. Amen. <laughs> yeah, and some skills, as you mentioned, are easier to kind of acquire or train as you, this, this technical parts. We have an amazing platform with Trailhead, but one of the questions that I saw pop up in the chat, and I know a lot of people have, is how about the soft skills? How can I improve those? Yeah, so happy to take that one. Uh, so uh, typically it, it is uh, training, right? So um, throughout my career at the, at the Capgemini, but also at the Salesforce, um, uh, I, I've been uh, trained in a particular uh, soft skill element, right? Uh, and I mentioned that onboarding uh, uh, program that we did. Uh, one of the elements um, was actually, um, I think it was called CXO Masters. Uh, so focused around uh, C-level engagement, right? How can you summarize uh, uh, and uh, bring things down to the most important th uh, elements um, when you are talking to a, a chief financial officer or a chief marketing officer or a chief sales officer, right? And being able to articulate and, and speak their language um, but in the basis have uh, still have that same technical solution, right? That you are responsible for. Um, so it, uh, finding uh, uh, training. Uh, and one thing uh, I learned in, in, uh, in real life is, is actually look at, okay, where am I struggling in, in, uh, in, in, in my uh, projects, right? Where are the things that where I'm constantly or typically uh, stuck in the conversations? And uh, can I actually uh, work on those skills and what type of uh, training uh, yeah. aligns with it? And then uh, obviously, if you look at the, uh, the preparation for the CTA, uh, you've gone through a couple of the, uh, the workshops now, right? The, the one that uh, Steve is uh, uh, providing. I think that's, um, there's a lot of uh, soft skill related elements in there, right? Even though uh, it is eventually around uh, preparing for uh, for a uh, solution in, in, the, in, in a very condensed time. But the actual presentation part, right? Uh, you really need to find the balance. Uh, what is the level of detail that I need to get across uh, in, the, in the, the one hour presentation, right? Uh, to ensure that judges understand my level of expertise as an architect. And that's, the, uh, uh, in itself, a balancing act and also a good soft skill training, I think. <laughs> I think that's absolutely true. And from my experience teaching the 901 and 902, uh, we were joking because when we put up the content, um, we were not necessarily trying to focus on how can we get people to pass the specific certification, but or certifications at the base of it, of the base of those two system and application architects, but more, how do you think as an architect? How do you ask the right questions? 
how do you think about the broader picture and then distill it to the kind of lower level? So like Ari was saying, there's a lot of uh, soft skills and communication, I think, element that went into those uh, trainings and is part of that, um, rather than maybe just focus on some specific uh, clicks in the solution, right? It's creating that kind of architect yeah. mindset. Um, and in terms of uh, developing soft skills, I think what helped me was to just put myself in different types of situations. I am an introvert. I am not very comfortable with public speaking, for instance, right? But I've repeatedly put myself in those kind of situations and it really helps you practice and get over that kind of um, um, uncomfortable feeling when you're in that situation. Um, plus take trainings like um, negotiation training, um, um, communication training. So what Aryan was mentioning, try to build those kind of soft skills also through uh, professional trainings is helpful. It's funny you mentioned that I, because I, I remember specifically the very first class I took at college was a public speaking course. And the, prof the professor said that day, he said, this will be the most important class you take in your life. And he couldn't have been more right about that. I mean, that, that, that course alone has you know, served me throughout my entire career. Um, I mean, because public speaking is a, is a fear for a lot of people. You know, they, people would rather die than speak in public. Um, but what helps to give you that confidence is having the technical expertise. So if you know your stuff, you definitely can be positioned much better to be presenting to, I see a question about presenting to C-levels as an example. Having the confidence that you know that your solution is sound, you've thought it through, you've weighed the pros and cons, so you can come at it um, from the perspective of, hey, this has been thought through very thoroughly. And the more you do that, as Dorina said, uh, the better you get at it, the more comfortable you get at it, and the more your confidence falls. And that's great. And that brought me, it brought something else to my mind in the sense of uh, having good soft skills is not only about you talking, it's about you listening a lot, right? So it's about how good am I as a listener and asking the right questions so that I understand what the other person is thinking about, what the other person's problems are. So to the question about how do you handle sea level uh, discussions, it's understanding in the first place your audience and what their focus is, because it's going to be completely different if you talk to the CFO uh, if, or if you talk to the CIO, right? So it's completely different perspectives and different interests that you need to be mindful of. And then your message needs to address those potential concerns or those areas of interest of those individuals. Um, if you just talk technical gibberish, then they probably won't understand it unless they've also been a CIO in their lives. And just, just on that point about, um, Steve's point about um, public speaking, I think wh when I speak to people that are looking to progress um, in their Salesforce careers and potentially um, go down the CTA path, people often look in the Salesforce ecosystem for everything. Um, but there's actually like there are amazing courses outside of the ecosystem that could help you with things that you can bring into the ecosystem. Um, so it's not just like Trailhead, as an example, isn't necessarily going to be the best place to learn to be a public speaker. Um, but something like Toastmasters might be a great way to improve your skills and then come back into the ecosystem um, to go down that path. So, so, yeah, look broader than just what you know and what we see every day in, in, in the ecosystem and think of ways that you can plug some of those soft skills gaps in other ways. And I just to add one thing on public speaking and getting used to it, I love what Joanna said about practicing, you know, getting getting uncomfortable and just pushing through. Um, I, I would recommend anyone who's in that situation to, you know, find a low stakes opportunity to practice your soft skills and your presenting skills, whether that's just presenting a small bit, maybe at a user group or on a Zoom call, um, that little things like that are going to add to your, your confidence and add to the lessons learned in, in your soft skills so that you can you know level up to maybe one day presenting in person once we get back there, so. And if I could add one more thing to that, I, I think if I gave you one piece of advice as far as how to work on your soft skills, don't ever be afraid to say that you don't know the answer to something. Uh, it is absolutely acceptable if a business user is challenging you on something or asking you a question to say, you know what, I'm not sure about that. Let me look into that and I will get back to you. Uh, that certainly, uh, that exudes confidence. It builds trust. 
with whoever it is that you're speaking with as well. We don't know everything. We all have to look things up. So don't be afraid to say, I'm not sure. Uh, I think it's this, but let me verify that and I'll get back with you. That's a very good point. And actually, it's one of the, the questions that I have as well is this, is this something that you experience a lot that there's this expectation of, okay, you're an architect, so you should know everything, right? I mean, I can ask you exactly how to do this or that minor thing. What are the settings for a connected app? And you should know. <laughs> how do you guys uh, experience this? I usually say I'm human. I can't, I can't possibly know everything. And there's just, there's so much to know in the Salesforce ecosystem. So, um, and uh, we, like when I do CTA office hours, one of the first things I say when I introduce, when I open up the session is I don't know everything. And if I don't know the answer, I'll tell you. Um, so, and I'm sure everybody else in the panel can attest to the same thing. It's just, you know, our brains can only hold so much. So. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, uh especially when uh, you earn the title of CTA, right? Uh, people uh, more or less look at uh, up uh, and say, well, you know everything, right? And there, there I know for, sur for sure, right? There's specialists in certain areas that know way deeper about the, uh, the ins and outs and also the uh, have uh, more scratches and bruises uh, when it comes to implementing those part of Salesforce, right? So um, yes. Um, being also able to say, well, I need to figure it out uh, is, is uh, definitely part of that uh, soft skill box. No. Great. So moving to a very, very popular question that lives in the ecosystem is what is the background that you should have uh, to become an architect? And I know that you're all going to say, yeah, there is no the background. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. But um, how do you get out of that comfort zone that you may have become into? How do you grow from different backgrounds? Can you elaborate on this? Um, so I, I'll coming, use yeah. just, uh, I'll, Steve, I'll just give a recent example. Like, so I'm teaching 901 right now and it goes through the sort of, that's for the application architect certification. And it kind of goes through recommended requirements for each one of those certifications all of them recommend some level of delivery experience. It doesn't necessarily mean Salesforce experience. And delivery can be a very broad term. But in essence, what that means is have experience being in front of customers and business users and listening. I think Dona said we talked about listening. Being able to communicate and listen and you know, really understand where they're coming from and what business problem they're actually asking you to solve. Uh, that, to me, that experience is invaluable. It's not something you can fake. Um, you can certainly sit down and cram for an exam and pass an exam, but that experience goes hand in hand with it. So just getting out there and being able to experience different projects, different types of users, different types of businesses is invaluable in my opinion. I agree with that. And I think it might not uh, come very easy at the beginning because you're not sure of yourself. Maybe you don't know exactly how to answer some of the questions that you're going to be asked. And one thing is to say, of course, like Steve, Steve said, I don't know everything, but let me check and I'll come back to you, right? Um, but also a good way is uh, shadowing others who are doing at least parts of the role that you want to do, right? So uh, shadow someone who is really good in talking to customers at different levels. Uh, shadow someone who is good in solution engineering. Shadow someone who is very good, I don't know, at security, if that's something you want to learn at a certain point in time. So try to gather those kind of inputs and experiences um, either from other people who are good at it or maybe get guidance from them or, or learn in those areas. And uh, like I was saying, my background is um, straightforward in terms of technology, but I know people like Susanna coming from music, history, uh, the, like uh, physicians, <laughs> all kinds of backgrounds. Uh, someone studied uh, Russian linguistics, I think, and he's a, uh, a uh, very uh, valuable um, uh, person at Salesforce, right? So people from different backgrounds, if they have the curiosity and the interest to learn, um, can, can join the Salesforce ecosystem, which is, uh, I would say, unique probably. I love the idea of shadowing, Doina, and that's a technique that I personally used. Um, and I think it's important to, if if you're a prospective architect and maybe working at a smaller organization, 
I think it's a, it's a hard decision, right? I, I was able to shadow because I moved to an organization where there was a whole cohort of architects and folks that I could uh, use as my mentors. Um, had I stayed at a smaller company and just said, Hey, can I, can I get my title bumped up? You know, I wouldn't have gained those skills. Maybe I would have had a title of, of architect, but um, I think making sure you're in the right place and connected with the right people so that you can gain those skills through shadowing or mentorship is, um, is something that it, you need to set up for yourself or choices that you need to make for yourself if you're passionate about pursuing the, the architect path. Yeah, exactly. So uh, I, uh, I like your point about finding those uh, those opportunities, right? Sometimes they may actually not be uh, there. Uh, that's one of the questions as well, right? I, if I don't have uh, people around me, then maybe uh, if you still aspire to become an architect and, and you're looking for um, yeah examples, right, and, and looking for shadow opportunities, then that might be a point to have a look at, if possible, obviously, uh, a yeah different type of organization or a different team, or uh, uh, it might actually be a trigger to look around for other job opportunities. Yeah. Obviously, if possible, right? So I understand that that's not always uh, part of the, uh, the possible options. Yeah, Domina, go ahead. Yeah, I was just thinking that even uh, even if you don't have that, and uh, some people maybe don't want that kind of environment, maybe you don't want to work in a big organization, and that's completely fine, right? It's a personal choice, which is fine. Then think about what are those areas where you do want to grow, and you don't, it doesn't have to be everything, right? So to Arian's point, there's so much out there. It doesn't have to be everything, but just what is at a certain point in time, the thing that you would like to learn more about? And then either try to gather information from different places, uh, learn by doing some of those things, test out a new whatever product from Salesforce, uh, try to get yourself exposed in different ways to, gather, uh, to uh, fill in some of those areas of interest that you have at a certain point in time. And don't try to overwhelm yourself, right? Just pick one or two areas that you're interested in and go for those. Yeah, I really, really like the idea of creating opportunities. And as you mentioned, maybe your company does not have the correct framework or the size or the roles that uh, allow you to shadow. In my experience, and I'm really curious to hear your point of view there is, through being proactive, sometimes you can also create opportunities within your company yourself. For example, maybe you see, okay, we may not have a solid data governance solution. And this is something that I find interesting, or maybe we can make our lives easier with SSO implementation and maybe introduce this or propose this. Do you think that is a valid strategy? Absolutely. I 200% believe in creating opportunities for yourself. Um, not because the world is perfect, the world is not perfect, but because um, we need to have that mindset of what is the, what are my strengths to Susanna's point and what is the value that I can bring in a certain context and where do I want to develop next, right? What is interesting to me and where do I want to develop next? And then try to create a path for you to grow into that direction that's of interest to you. So whenever I join, to be honest, an organization, I don't think about, oh, what does the job description say and is it gonna be good for me or not? I think about, okay, what is the job um, offering in terms of possibilities of growth? Maybe not necessarily at a certain point in time, but how do I build this role to be my own? And how do I create that kind of um, impact on my side in that particular context? And where do I go from there? So I'm absolutely a total believer of creating opportunities. If I just, could, uh, yeah, sorry, I was just, just about to ask you, go ahead. 
in my experience, that that's what every company wants, right? They want go getters and people. And ultimately, yes, you you are hired to deliver on um, a job description or uh, responsibilities that, that job has. But um, that's how you get progress. That's how you progress in your career by going above and beyond and identifying ways that you can add value to to that company. So um, so yeah, in any um, role, even if it's not architecture, whatever path you want to go down, it's about taking more opportunity onto your workload and showing ways that you can kind of benefit the business and um, and expand your knowledge. Um, but also to the point where, um, you know, shadowing others. And um, one, one amazing thing about this ecosystem is that everyone is so helpful. Um, so if you don't have someone to shadow in your current company, um, I suggest that you reach out to people that you know or can see are strong in the areas that you want to gain extra experience in. Um, and I, I would do that in a way that not just asking them to download their information to you, but going to them with, you know, some ideas or um, something that you've done and asking their opinion on that, because that will enable them to open up a lot more than just you asking for their help um, or asking them to tell you the answer. Go to people with different ideas that you've had around different topics that you're looking to learn. And uh, and I, I think you'll find that people are really, really willing to, to help you in this ecosystem. Okay, interesting, Ben, that you say that as well, and that you create, um, you should create value for yourself. Um, an interesting question that we saw a lot come back is, what value do certifications have, have in, uh, in that? Ben, that's your question. <laughs> um, it depends who you're asking, right? So I think everyone has a different opinion on certifications. And um, I, I definitely see lots of value in, in having them. I think um, I see value in having them if, if you've gained the knowledge and you've studied for them in the right way. Um, there's no value to a certification just having it if you don't have the knowledge behind it, right? Because um, you're, you're certifying that you have that knowledge. And if you don't, then, then it's not worth it. Um, so going through the right process and, and studying and, and, you know, doing the, the right things to get certifications, absolutely, they're valuable. Um, and then obviously, um, you know, if you're progressing towards a, a certain path like the CTA, you have to have them anyway. So, um, so yeah, absolutely, I think they're, they're, they're good to have. But it doesn't mean that you're not a capable um, operator or a capable architect or um, a capable developer if you don't have certifications, because some people just choose not to go down that path. Um, so I don't think you can make an assessment purely on whether or not someone has them or doesn't have them. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I think everyone has a different opinion, but in my view, um, if you're serious about a Salesforce career, then certifications are something that you should consider and, uh, and look to, to achieving. And Ben, if I could add to that, I mean, I, I would hire experience over certifications 10 out of 10 times, really the individual and the experience they have. Uh, I mean, we've had many people on our team who have come in with, you know, little to no Salesforce experience and no Salesforce certifications, and they are our top performers. Um, you know, because the, the focus is really on who they are as an individual and what they bring to the table, their ability to be in front of a customer, their analytical skills. Uh, and fortunately, Salesforce gives us so many resources to prepare for these certifications that it's just a matter of dedicating the time and say, okay, now go, now go learn this and now go learn that. So I agree, I agree with Ben. I think certifications, while they're valuable, certainly not one of the first things that I look at. So one thing uh, I think that sets aside uh, the CTA certification uh, from others is definitely this. This, um, this is off. Yeah, uh, with the whole pyramid, obviously there's there's um, multiple choice exams and and learning uh, certain uh, yeah aspects of of the technology. Uh, but the 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 last part is obviously a very uh, applied uh, practical test, right? where you will see that if you don't, if you lack the experience as an architect, uh, you won't be able to go as deep as is required for the review board. So um, the, the certifications, and you may have seen that in, on Trailhead, right? More and more of the certifications actually have a, a component, uh, a similar type of component in it. Uh, so for instance, the uh, JavaScript developer, right? Uh, requires you to go through the uh, super batch that is uh, connected to it. Same for uh, P uh, platform developer two, right? Uh, requires a super batch. So um, that will uh, bring in, right? The combined aspects of experience, 
showcasing that experience with uh, the certification. Um, and obviously, uh, still, right, uh, there also needs to be that part in your CV that actually says, oh, yeah, I, I, I worked as a developer. Um, and and uh, you should be able to almost show those scratches and bruises that you still have from the, the experience. But yeah, I, I agree. Um, it, it's harder to um, really uh, check people's uh, value uh, value in real life based on certifications versus um, yeah the actual experience in in the field. Agreed with what everyone said. Uh, I was just going to add that um, one way that certifications I think can be helpful, um, especially once you already have that base level experience, is just to keep fresh on new products. Like Doina was saying, to have that continual mindset of learning, um, preparing for a certification, either maybe before you start a new project or just to gain some additional skills is personally a nice way to keep learning. It's not necessarily going to, you know, get you a job in that brand new area. But um, for me, that's a way I found to sort of motivate myself to continue to keep learning um, just as a, as a tool from, for myself personally. And learning is a combination of breadth and depth. So learning doesn't necessarily mean that you have to keep learning new things. Uh, you can continue learning and just master the skills that you have experience and expertise in already. So I know it, I know it's easy to kind of feel overwhelmed. It's like, oh, I've got to do this cert and this cert. I've got to learn that. I've got to learn Commerce Cloud. It's okay to stay narrow, stay focused on what you know, what you love to do and what you're focused, working on right now, and you can just build on it over time. Um, I know it can feel kind of you know a little bit of pressure to be like, well, I've got to get this one and I've got to get that one. Um, stay, in, stay in your swim lane, you know, you master that skill. It's okay to go really deep on integrations or security and really become a domain expert in those areas. Yeah, and I think you mentioned as well the value of those experts when you are an architect and working together with them and getting their knowledge. So definitely it's, it's yeah, a very, very valuable uh, expertise to have, very valuable to projects, right? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I think that uh, that's uh, a very uh, yeah good point to make, right? It's not like um, there's a higher value or something uh, uh, typically between uh, architects uh, versus um, a uh, real deep subject matter expert in a particular area, right? Um, what happens obviously is that a particular subject area uh, might become uh, less, uh, how do you say that, in demand. And, and then, uh, obviously, as a subject matter expert, you'd need to look at reskilling in another area that is in higher demand at that point in time. Uh, whereas an, as an architect, right, uh, typically you would be able to um, yeah, uh, skill up, maybe utilize a platform like Trailhead, uh, which allows you to bite size, um, get to know a certain area, right? Um, but still, it, 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 there's value in both. And, uh, and there's different ways of uh, um, attacking the, the, the upskilling, I, I think, and keeping up with uh, your area of expertise. Yeah, thank you so much for those insights. And I wanted to jump back to a question we were discussing earlier. Uh, I would like your input, Ben, on how can you, as someone in the ecosystem who might think of switching careers uh, to pursue certain opportunities or to get more challenging projects, how can you assess as a candidate companies and, and uh, whether you or not they will allow you to grow? Because I don't think that's very easy. <laughs> Uh, it's a it's an interesting point because I think people really focus in interviews on what they're going to be asked and then forget about what they can ask themselves. Um, and it's really important actually to have a game plan in an interview to understand how that company can add value to your career and not just how you can add value to the business. Um, so I think it's really understanding what what the the clear path for training is and how seriously they take um, a Salesforce career path in that business because not every business 
we'll see the value of a CTA like a Salesforce partner business will, um, or like Salesforce do. Um, you know, a, a, a bank might not see that as as valuable as, as some other career paths that people want to go down. So it's identifying those things through an interview and understanding who are the mentors um, who are the people that I can learn from and who will I be working with on a daily basis? And also being really honest and upfront about your goals. Um, because if your goals aren't going to align to something they can offer, then it isn't the right environment for you, even if it's a right, the, the salary is right. And, um, and, and, you know, the role seems like an interesting role. If, if you're going to be looking in six months time, because you don't have a mentor in that company, or there's, um, you know, no one that you can learn from, then it's not the right business. So, so yeah, I think it's really just trying to ask open questions in an interview or through the interview process to understand if it's going to be the right environment for you long term. And outside the interview process, try and find people who work where you're interviewing. Um, try and get that inside. I know it's not always possible, but try and get that inside insight, inside insight into the team into the company at the very least. Um, I made that mistake once in my career of moving to a company where I did not ask what the culture was like from someone who worked there, where I didn't do that due diligence. And I definitely did pay the price of immediately realizing like, okay, this, this fit is, this culture fit isn't right. Um, so do your best to do your homework outside the interview as well. Maybe one thing to add to what was said before is um, uh, be mindful uh, who you will be working with. That's going to be very, very important, right? So for me, it was always not only about um, is this company interesting? Is the business that they do interesting for me? Can I learn and grow in some of those areas that they're uh, supporting or that they're enabling through their business? But also, would I have a good fit with this person as my manager, because your manager will be very important probably. And the people around you who are maybe willing to, to help you out, to teach you, to share their experiences will be equally important, right? So to me, is it, will this person allow me to grow and help me grow and give me development opportunities? Or will I have a hard time working with that individual? Uh, and then, of course, you think about the business and uh, how it uh, helps you develop. And funnily enough, Ben, to your point, uh, will a bank understand the value of a CTA? Well, I think many end users of Salesforce nowadays understand more and more the value of an architect. <laughs> so when I worked at Barclays, I know I did understand that value pretty well. So um, things, I think, are shifting in the ecosystem a bit. Good point about the uh, um, who is hiring you and, and who you uh, will you be working with, right? I think um, it, I don't know numbers, but uh, I think the majority of people leave uh, a certain job not because of um, dislike of the the work that they do, uh, but typically just because of the manager, right? Uh, that uh, basically is not supportive of uh, your career development or. Uh, yeah, the, just the general, uh, um, how to say that, bad feeling that is, uh, is coming out of the relationship with the, with the manager. So keep that in mind because that, that will actually set you up for success or maybe uh, not so success, right? Yeah, totally. I think that fit that you guys mentioned with regard to the people and the culture is, is crucial, of course. The, in my opinion, I always want to share the values and ideology of a company so that I know that we will definitely continue working and striving for the same thing. I'm very lucky that I found this. It's not always that easy, that's true. Um, maybe uh, going back to the, the, the question that people are having with regard to um, how do I become an architect? One of the frequently asked questions there is also how much experience should I have? And I don't think it's easy to quantify like so many years and your goals, <laughs> I guess it's a more complex answer there. Well, I'll start quickly by saying I have seen uh, amazing architects that have 20 plus years of experience in different areas, not necessarily Salesforce because Salesforce almost was not uh, as long around, right? But um, experience in different ways that build up to, to have that kind of broader knowledge. 
Uh, however, I've also seen very, very strong architects that have just several years of experience in Salesforce. And I know a couple of them who are CTAs and honestly, I've worked with them and they're just amazing people, right? So it's also about how much passion do you put behind it and how much learning and dedication you have. And uh, by saying that, I'm not talking necessarily about uh, time-wise in the sense of you shouldn't do anything else than learn Salesforce, right? No, not that, but um, are you focusing on learning more and developing uh, continuously? And I guess that's, um, uh, yeah, I think I've seen the range of like eight years, if not less of experience all the way to 20 plus. Obviously the answer is 42, right? But uh, <laughs> nay, I agree. So uh, I think um, uh, it depend, uh, depends on also what type of architect uh, you want to be, right? Because uh, I think there's, uh, we, we talked about uh, more technical focused architects, but there's also uh, a, um, a breed of uh, more business focused architects, right? Uh, in, in the column of uh, solution architects, um, inside Salesforce, for example, we have business architects um, that might actually come from a, a very strong um, educational background and uh, could swiftly pivot, uh, and even with just a couple of years of experience, uh, to that bi uh, business architect role. Um, so it uh, depends a bit on, on the type of architect you, that you uh, want to uh, become, and also definitely agree with you, uh, Doina, the uh, level of curiosity and, um, uh, yeah, I guess, um, commitment mostly right not even time commitment but really uh, devotion maybe that's the uh, more the word right that you have in um, yeah uh, in skilling up and uh, curiosity about the job and and uh, yeah looking around looking for examples maybe finding a coach and and uh, really building that uh, architecture skill Yeah, I think I completely agree. But um, when I hear you guys talking, I think, especially within Salesforce, professional development is key. It's continuously evolving. You have these three releases a year. If you don't read up, you, you get left behind, so to speak. And it's it's a very, uh, it, it's challenging, but it's also full of possibilities because of this, right? So you have a lot of flexibility on where you want to grow, where you want to end up with. Um, are companies aware do you think, Ben, um, of the flexibility that these candidates then also require or, or want or need to be able to function uh, in the Salesforce ecosystem, let's say? Is this something that the professional development that they are aware of? As in, are most companies aware and, and willing to give that, that kind of time? Yeah, I think it, it really it depends. Um, is the the architecture answer? I think um, I think that's that's what a good architect says, right? It depends. So um, it, it really does come down to who the company is, and and I, I mean to to Doina's point about like banks now seeing value in CTAs. Absolutely, there are many companies out there, end customers that that do see value in having someone going down that path. Um, I think it just really depends, and and understanding you know, and being able to articulate the value of of getting that that exposure and, and investing your own time into studying how does that benefit them and i think if you can articulate that to your manager then then they they absolutely can see the value and they'll, they'll give you more flexibility to to upskill and study and um and continue learning and as long as also they know that that's that's the path that you're going down and why that's important to you um because ultimately if you're a good operator in this ecosystem people want to keep you engaged they don't want to lose you to other companies that's, I think, for many people in the call, a great relief to see that companies share this vision. So that's really, really nice. Um, I did see an interesting question fly by because we were talking a lot about communication as an architect and talking to different people. So do you need to be a manager to be an architect? Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, so... I think there's there's lots of so I uh, maybe uh, uh, to bring in that angle I've I've spent uh, uh, a little over five years as an operational manager when I was uh, working at Capgemini, 
um, combining it actually with the uh, so being the responsibility of um, 35, uh, eventually up to uh, 80 people, and combining that with a role at the uh, customer side uh, too. Um, the the actual uh, skills you learn right uh, are helpful as a, in your architect profession too, uh, because um, obviously in your team you'll have uh, people from all walks of life uh, that you need to manage, and uh, also different type of demands come in, and also different uh, type of conversations. Right? Uh, there's people that that uh, are maybe in a part of their career uh, that they're not looking to uh, really develop or keep up with the latest technology. Uh, but there's also people that are eager and want to um, uh, continue grow and uh, maybe grow faster than the organization can uh, can support even, right? Um, so you have different type of conversation with those people and um, the communication aspects, but also uh, elements like uh, delegating and uh, being, yeah, I think uh, driving decisions and uh, also a bit of the stakeholder alignment, right? So understanding that, uh, for example, uh, to keep uh, a fast grower on board, you need uh, to provide a bit more uh, salary or a bit more com uh, conversation to those people. That requires you to talk to your manager again and say, yeah, <laughs> Uh, I know this is the budget for this year, but, right, so um, uh, several angles as part of the uh, manager, um, yeah, uh, role that will help you as an architect in, in yeah, developing skills uh, that you can apply again in your architect role. Is it necessary? Um, yeah, I'm a firm, a firm believer it's not, but then you need another means of, um, yeah, developing those skills. Um and uh, it's also a bit of um, a difference across organizations, right? I know uh, in many system integrator organizations, for example, um, you more or less uh, get, um, how do I say that, promoted uh, with a manager role. Uh, basically, after you've done a good job, even as an architect at the customer side, uh, the immediate next step is, okay, now you become responsible for a group of people, which is not necessarily the right choice, uh, uh, even uh, for your personal development, right? So that's always good, good to keep that in mind and um, yeah, puts pressure on organizations as well to uh, provide options for people, right? Either grow as an uh, individual contributor or grow uh, by yeah uh, skilling up as a as a manager. Yeah, thanks so much for that insight. I think you know that really answers the question that uh, the person in the chat had. Um, maybe going into the domain of CTA and and the journey there. I think um, we've all already talked a lot about growth and development and. From my personal experience, I haven't grown um, for any certification as much as I've grown for <laughs> the CTA one. It's um, and I, I knew from other people's testimonials that this was going to be the case, but it was more than I expected. It's it's insane. So can you talk us through kind of like your own reflections throughout the journey and the growth that you see with other people's because. I know that you all have a lot of other um, aspiring CTAs that you talk to, coach. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I'll take that one first, uh, Lilith. Uh, I mean, I've had the pleasure of seeing people really early on in their journey and then actually seeing them at uh, the CTA workshop and then the CTA readiness uh, assessment and then at the review board and see them pass. And it's extremely fulfilling to see them go through that journey. Um, what I have typically seen is most folks um, have got really, really strong depth in Salesforce expertise, and they really know their stuff. Because um, again, Salesforce does such a great job of giving us so much material to learn from. Um, what's been great to see, though, is how people focus on almost the harder side of the review board, which is actually getting through that time period where you only have three hours to solution something and then present it to a panel of CTAs, which speaking from experience is extremely intimidating <laughs> to go through and then uh, have them survive uh, a Q&A period. And I use the word survive when I do the six-one workshop, I talk about surviving the day. 
Um, so it's really about the ability to, to quickly solution something and then be able to effectively communicate that. I can't emphasize how effective communication is so important to, uh, you know, as a successful part of your CTA journey, is being able to say, here's my solution, here's why I think it will work, here are some options that I considered, um, and I think this is going to be best for this customer and for these particular sets of requirements. Uh, and, you know, we see candidates stumble on communication, just the ability for them to get it out to us and say, here's what I want to do and here's why I'm going to do it. Um, and seeing people kind of progress through that um, is, is very satisfying for me to see that because it's difficult to do. As somebody who is, believe it or not, is an introvert, it's, it's difficult to do. So I can definitely appreciate the challenge that that If I can add to what Steve said, yeah. so I've been both um, a coach, I've also been a judge, so I've seen people develop from multiple perspectives, plus I have my own experience, right? So if I think of my own experience, when I decided to go for the architect journey, I felt quite strong to Steve's point on the technical side. I also had, I would say, reasonable communications uh, capabilities at that point in time. However, when I really started preparing, I started discovering really my gaps and started filling in those gaps uh, a depth. And uh, it forced me in a way to uh, go and study areas that otherwise I wouldn't have been as interested in going and studying. So it also helped me create that kind of breadth. So not only the identifying the gaps that I had and uh, go and fill those in, but also, um, so not only from a depth, uh, but also from a breadth perspective. And what I see uh, coach, what I've seen coaching uh, people to become uh, architects is, at the beginning, even if they are maybe strong technically, uh, they, um, to Steve's point, don't know exactly how to communicate. And you can get that by practicing. So the only way you get that is by practicing, by joining groups like the Simo one, right? Um, doing this with peers of yours, uh, presenting over and over again until you get comfortable with your pace, with how you draw your diagrams, with how you explain things to the depth uh, that you go with your explanations, even the, the pace of your voice, right, of your speech, uh, you'll get to know by practicing. So practice at least like six to eight mocks, if not more, uh, just presenting until basically, to be honest, it gets boring. And when you're to that point where it, it's really boring to do it, oh no, my God, another mock, then you're probably ready for it. <laughs> yeah, uh, maybe also to uh, Pradeep's uh, question, he's asking what's after CTA, right? Um, I think uh, if you look at the CTA, um, so I, I sometimes, by the way, uh, talk to uh, about the CTA as more or less the Salesforce MBA, because I think uh, if you look at the amount of effort and time and, and uh, um, yeah, and, and uh, yeah, the effort that you need to put in, right, this is fairly similar to an MBA. Um, uh, but um, I always uh, compare, especially that last lag in preparing for the review board, uh, as the preparation that uh, um, yeah, a, a, an athlete would do uh, while preparing for the uh, Olympics, right? So uh, you definitely need to be at your top uh, when you need to go for the review board. Uh, you should not overdo it uh, and uh, be ready, uh, I don't know, weeks before. Uh, and you should not be, I don't know, uh, not ready yet and, uh, and, and still need a couple of weeks to, uh, to go there, right? Um, and then uh, what's what's next? Yeah, there is a bit of a gap, right? Uh, I think you hear uh, athletes that join or that are going for the Olympics and, and uh, win a golden or uh, yeah, a golden medal. Um, the moment that that they've uh, earned that medal, right? Then there's there's a yeah, what else is there to achieve? So um, that also is something to keep in mind, uh, probably. Uh, yeah, first of all, work towards that CTA, but also, um, yeah, it's not the end, uh, yeah, the end station, right, of, of your career, because um, there's a, uh, there's lots of new possibilities uh, uh, that it opens up. 
for you, right? In, in career development, in the roles that you can pick up and, and uh, that you're asked to do. Uh, secondly, there's still uh, so much stuff to learn. Right? Like uh, Doina mentioned, right? Um, when we did the uh, the CTA, uh, you could go for the review board just by uh, preparing a, um, uh, a multiple choice exam, uh, which was called the CTA 2. Um, afterwards, you needed to have the system and application architect. Um, and I think you did that as well, Dorna, right? Uh, uh, I continued with those certifications because I wanted to know what the experience was about, right? Uh, it's it's fairly easy if you have the CTA because you know all the shit, <laughs> but it's a, um, it is a, a fun uh, to get them and, and uh, understand uh, while you're talking to other architects, um, also within Salesforce, uh, what it is about, right? What those uh, uh, certifications are about and, and whether you would be able to get them or, or not. So. Absolutely. So I, I had exactly the same experience, Ariane. So I had the CTA at that point in time. I had uh, um, all of the seven certifications that were out there. And then we created uh, additional certifications in the Salesforce area. And I still went and uh, got my application architect, system architect, um, and a bunch of others after I had the CTA. So I didn't need to do any more certifications. I just wanted to because it was a good refresher for me. Uh, it was interesting. I learned a bunch of new things. Well, most of it I probably knew already, but I still did learn some new things. So it was still interesting. And to Ariane's point, just having that experience of, okay, so what would it be if I now went and took a certification? How would, how would that feel like, right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah thanks so much. So um, from a job market point of view, Ben, you said that you placed two CTAs, but I'm guessing there's way more demand than, <laughs> than there is availability there. So um, how is that part of the market? How do you deal with this? Um, so it's, it's actually quite rare for a company to come to us and, and say they're looking for us to hire a CTA um, because they, there are so few around. I mean, we in, in Australia, we actually... Um, we, I think we probably punch above our weight. We have quite a good number of CTAs in comparison to how many people there are in the market. Um, but usually people come to us and say, we need a technical architect. And then if we can come back with a certified technical architect, uh, even better, I, I, it makes us look amazing at our job. Um, but the reality is if someone is a certified technical architect and they start looking for work, then they'll have opportunities left, right and center. Um, so it's not, not often that they have to apply for you know, a specific job. If a CTA becomes available and they they go to five, six, ten, however many companies and say, you know, I'm I'm open to new challenges, um, they'll get job offers quite quickly. And the first CTA that I, I placed, they had eight other job offers when I um, I placed them in a role. Um, so uh, so yeah, nine job offers in total. And, and fortunately for me, they took the role that I presented. Um, but uh, but yeah, there's there's a huge amount of opportunity out there. But you probably aren't going to see job boards and and job adverts saying you know we're looking for a CTA. Um, it's more often than not going to be we're looking for a technical architect, and um, and companies would be very happy if a CTA applied. Yeah, thanks. Great to know. Um, one of the things that I would like to discuss because I know it may be a taboo topic, but the CTA is kind of like the holy grail. Everyone wants it, right? But it's not suited, I think, for necessarily everyone. Um, how do you guys feel about this? What do you think? Um, should Who should or should not go for the CTA? Why should or should not people go for this? <laughs> Maybe, let me give my perspective. I don't think, um, I don't think it is the ultimate goal, right? It, and it shouldn't be. It's just something that maybe some people are interested in pursuing and it's as okay if people are not interested in, pursue, interested in pursuing that. Does it open some doors? Yes. Does it make it, things easier when you try to position yourself as a knowledgeable person? If you have that certification, most likely yes. But is it an end goal? not necessarily if that's not what's interesting to you, right? So if not all of those components there are interesting to you, then why would you put yourself through that kind of pain if you don't need to, right? Uh, just think about what, you're, uh, what you like doing. And if you like being a Salesforce administrator, 
honestly, I love those people, right? And they're super good at their jobs and that's what they like doing and that's what they want to do. And I think everything in that breadth of roles that Salesforce offers is valuable. Agreed. And in terms of maybe uh, people who should go for the CTA and people who shouldn't, um, I don't know. It, to me, it's all about, uh, do you have the interest of learning about those things? Would you enjoy your work as an architect in whatever uh, position, right? Technical architect, solution architect, whatever, but having that kind of certification, will it really make you enjoy the roles that you will get? Um, and also, do you have the um, uh, willingness to put all of the work in to prepare for it, to learn for it and to do all of those uh, mocks and all of that preparation and exercise? It does take some effort and it's not always easy to blend yes. everything into your life. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, maybe also the time, uh, consider the timing, right? And maybe uh, one uh, analogy that uh, my, um, uh, my CTA coach actually made um, and I think works uh, quite well. Uh, he compared it to, he made the analogy uh, with the CTA and Formula One. Um, a CTA, passing the CTA is, is actually not um, becoming a Formula One driver, right? Because that's just a happy few and you need a bit of luck and a big mag be, uh, uh, bag of money. And you also need the network and uh, have maybe a, a dad that has been around in Formula One. Um, but I think uh, the CTA compares to um, the pit crew, right? The people that actually, uh, those mechanics that are working on, uh, on the cars and uh, typically the ones that actually uh, are involved in, in the pit stops, right? Um, those are uh, great mechanics. They, they know uh, all ins and outs of those, that car, right? And they train a lot uh, to actually exercise the job uh, and uh, in a very small amount of time um, and be very good at it. Um, there's, a, there's a huge amount of, of mechanics uh, around, right? So people that uh, on a daily basis repair uh, typical cars, uh, uh, they all with the right level of effort and the right uh, level, uh, level of skilling up would eventually be able to uh, be part of a Formula One pit crew. Uh, will they? Will everyone like to be there? No. Um, will everyone uh, like to dedicate the, uh, so much time because it means traveling around the, uh, the globe, not seeing your family, and and spending crazy hours uh, repairing a Formula One car? Right. That's not for everyone. So um, that analogy uh, might help in understanding that yeah, uh, there's nothing wrong if you don't aspire to be a CTA. Um, and uh, still be a heck of an architect, right? Um, but yeah, it, it can be fun, right? Oh, it is most definitely fun. I've enjoyed it tremendously so far, and I think I'm far from alone in this regard. But maybe um, another follow-up on this is that through those additional certifications that Salesforce has put out there with the application, with the system, now the B2C, I just received an email yesterday about the B2B, so it's coming up soon, I'm guessing, too. Yes, exactly. We do see more recognition maybe from Salesforce that there is such a spectrum, which is what we mentioned in the beginning of our call, too. And that, you know, there is value in, in just the broadness of the role. Absolutely. Right, so so uh, already the system and application architect, I think, um, are very valuable for uh, by uh, Thank you for joining us. Um, uh, the the value of that is already uh, uh, a lot, right? Because you learn already uh, uh, such a broad spectrum of of the platform and uh, and best practices and how to actually apply things. So. Yeah, uh, in that sense, uh, it is also good that we're we're broadening the spectrum of certifications, uh, including uh, B two C. Although that's a biggie as well, right? So uh, because it, uh, the prerequisite uh, prerequisites for that uh, certification are quite uh, strong. The same goes for the B two B solution architect. Um, you need quite a lot uh, before you can even start with these. But yes, you're right. Um, it is um, an acknowledgement of the fact that, um, yeah, there's not 
only CTAs out there. <laughs> Yes, definitely. And indeed, so um, uh, Susanna and Steve had to drop off because they had other meetings. So, um, but I have a few more questions. So I would like to steal a bit more of your time to tackle those, um, no if that's okay. So um, just in general, are there any misconceptions that you all see about careers in the ecosystem, about Salesforce? Maybe it's, we, we know that it's flexible, maybe it's easy to enter, um, maybe people have some misconceptions there, Ben, maybe from your side? Yeah, I think that um, Salesforce do an amazing job of marketing. Um, sorry, Arian, I'm, I, I won't say anything out of turn, um, but they do an amazing job of marketing and, and there's all totally. of these stats totally you see around, you know, we need 2 million more people in the ecosystem to be able to fill all of the jobs that we're creating by 2025 and things like that. And, and I'm sure there's a lot of truth to that, but there's also um, a misconception that that means that you can come into the ecosystem and get a job really quickly. Um, and, and starting at a, at a lower level, uh, perhaps coming into the, the ecosystem without any IT experience um, or coming in as an admin. And, and it's very hard. Like we see a lot of people really struggling to find a role in the ecosystem. Um, so, so yeah, unfortunately there are some misconceptions that every single person can come in and pick up a job quickly. Um, I think there are some, um, some roles that would be easier to make the transition. Like if you're coming, if you're a Java developer and you're coming in as a, a developer, then you're probably going to find a role quicker than if you're a, uh, postman and you're looking for an admin role right and and unfortunately some people think that's going to be an easy transition to make um so that's one misconception and then i think there is a lot of misunderstanding um around or maybe a lot of confusion and and different ideas between the role of a solution architect and a technical architect um and the crossover and how that translates into the broader it market um and i we we, we do an annual survey every year and I think 70 odd percent of solution architects um, that we surveyed said that they came from a development background. Um, so that's like 70 percent of solution architects said that they came from a coding background. So we see that that um, that solution and technical ar architect title being used interchangeably. Um, and, and I don't think there's a really clear message over which what what the the differences are. Um, and I think everyone, whenever we hear that question, everyone says the same thing. Solution architect is more functional. Technical is is more technical. Um, but I don't think there's a, a really consistent message from Salesforce about that. And and people kind of use the titles and not uh, they're not sure what path they should be going down. So that's one kind of um, confusing thing I think we see in the market. Right. So I, I, I agree, right? So, um, um, if you, well, if I uh, speak from my own uh, perspective, right? I joined uh, uh, Salesforce with um, almost 20 years of IT experience, non Salesforce, right? Um, only that helped me in achieving the CTA so fast, right? Because I, I knew. Uh, what it meant to be an architect, and I knew uh, other solutions, uh, similar type of solutions, other CRM solutions, right? So um, that helped me in actually relating immediately uh, past experiences to the uh, Salesforce technology and um, also the Salesforce implementation work, right? And which particular ex uh, uh, questions to ask and, and how to deep dive and where to uh, pay attention and those type of things. So um, um, maybe what you're seeing now is that people start their career um, with focus only on Salesforce, uh, which is, is good in, its, in itself, but also uh, understand that there is value to look a bit outside of the Salesforce ecosystem, right? So even uh, I could foresee that uh, people will benefit of even uh, taking a, a small step outside of the, the Salesforce technology and, uh, and learn something else um, as a technical skill rather than uh, what we already uh, talked about, the, uh, the uh, focusing on the soft skills. Also, uh, learning a bit more uh, about adjacent technologies, um, and that could be other cloud solutions, but it could also uh, very well be 
for instance, focusing on um, integration uh, solutions or uh, even uh, things like ERP solutions and, and how they work out uh, for enterprises. Yeah, and I think this overlap of skills and technologies and knowledge that you may want to know is become even greater now that Salesforce has introduced uh, the Lightning Web Components some time back where you have all these yeah, frameworks that you can now start using where you might want to pull in some front-end developers into the ecosystem rather than scouring um, the boards trying to find someone who can do all of this. Absolutely, agree. Uh, so it's an opportunity, right? Um, both ways. So it's an opportunity to uh, understand a bit more about the the um, the, the web framework uh, uh, area, right? Uh, when you're coming from a Salesforce uh, background, but there's also an opportunity for uh, developers that come from uh, um, that framework area uh, to step into the Salesforce world and understand what's possible there. Yeah. Okay, so um, because as you mentioned, there are quite a bit of people looking for maybe similar positions right now, Ben. What do what should people or could people do to make themselves stand out? We already mentioned that certs will not beat um, experience, but um, networking or branding or community work are those things that play a role too. A hundred percent. I I completely agree with what Arian was saying about learning broader than just Salesforce as well, because I think that is a differentiator in itself. Um, if someone only knows Salesforce um, and they're, they're new to the market, but all they've done is study Trailhead and then someone else has done Trailhead, but also taken a, a programming um, course in Node.js, um, then, then that person is valuable because they've, they, they understand the broader technology landscape. So that's one, one way. Um, I, I'm huge on, um, on personal branding. And I think that's, that's a real um, key angle for anyone that's looking to, to, to make a move into the ecosystem. Um, just by being visible and, and having, um, having creating content around what you're learning, what you're studying, and, and ultimately what you're doing. Um, and, and when I say what you're doing, I mean, what are you actually building in a developer org um, that is not something you're doing in Trailhead, but that's something that you've taken the initiative and you've, you've shown that you've got real life hands-on Salesforce capability um build something that that could have been useful for an old company you worked for or um build something that you can use to to around your house to to track stuff and um i, I always use the example of building a, a job application tracker in a developer org and, and it can send you reminders and it can um tell you when you've worked with a bad recruiter not to work with that one again and things like that um obviously not me um, or a good but, one right <laughs> <laughs> yeah um but things like that, right? There's, there's a the, the the beauty of Salesforce is they give you a developer org. You can actually. I, I spent um, seven years recruiting for SAP, and I I never once saw an SAP screen. I wouldn't be able to tell you what SAP looks like. Um, but I use Salesforce every day, and and I've I've got my Salesforce admins uh, by using Trailhead and by building things in a, a developer org. So um, my advice to people that are looking to build a career in this space and don't have experience is make your own experience and then and then document it and put it online and and ask people's opinion or ask senior people how they would have done it differently and and you're just building traction and building your brand and and. I've, I've got a number of examples where people have done that and then companies have reached out to them directly and hired them rather than the people having to just apply for jobs on job boards. Yeah, I think it's circling back to um, what we mentioned in the beginning, especially Doina with creating opportunities, right? So in doing these things, you show that you're proactive, that you are interested and passionate about this system. And also in, in venturing out a bit, it means that you have already the uh, foresight, let's say, to know that it's not an island. Salesforce is never an island, right? Yeah, and I think what else we can do to differentiate ourselves when we are in the actual interviews, right? How well do we know who we are talking to? So have we looked a little bit um, the person up, uh, not to be creepy or anything, but just to understand what their role is and what their interests might be, right? So what's their take on the role that you're applying for? And how can you bring value from your experience, even if it's not Salesforce experience, to that role? And it might be even that if you have enterprise uh, architecture experience like Aryan had, 
that is of course something that is very translatable immediately, right? But even if you have something like, I don't know, music uh, training experience like Susanna, that um, complexity in the uh, thinking uh, and that creativity can also be a value add when you go into that interview, right? So think about, okay, so who is the person I'm talking to? What, what could be their interest in this particular role? What does the job description say? And how can I bring value, not only from the ex exact experience that matches each line there, but from my broader previous experience? How do I translate that in, to creating value and trying to articulate that? And have some good questions there at the end uh, that help you identify if it's the right person and if it's the right company is always helpful. I guess it's the easiest way to show that you really are proactive is by at least preparing for <laughs> the interview, right? So yeah, definitely. So we're almost at the end of our call, but I do would like to ask each and every one of you, if you have some parting words, some words of wisdom, maybe something that you would have hoped people would have told you uh, in the beginning of your career. For me, uh, again, going back to the fact that I'm personally an introvert, for me, it was about uh, asking for help uh, early enough. Uh, if there's something I don't know, uh, I go and study to death and until I try to, uh, until I manage to understand something. I don't naturally go out and ask for help. And if I had done that earlier in my career, I think it would have helped me accelerate. Yeah, asking for help is a great advice. I think we all are guilty of maybe stalling there. Thank you so much, Doina. Arian? Yeah, I'm thinking. Um, I think uh, a curiosity uh, and, and staying curious, uh, the, 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 the uh, always keeping on asking questions uh, would be my advice, right? So uh, I think that's a, that's a trade that is helpful in uh, in the architect role, but in general, right, helps you, uh, yeah, uh, progress because um, if if you're curious about, hey, how would that work, or um, why uh, am I experiencing this, right, in the soft skills area, um, then that immediately leads you to, um, yeah, uh, looking for uh, uh, sources that can help you out. So. Um, if there's one thing, uh, stay curious, right? And again, um, it, there's there's also value in uh, just being a, a hack of an architect. Uh, so don't uh, focus too much, right, on uh, certifications and, and getting those. Uh, end of the day, there should be more an uh, inevitable outcome, right, of the work that you do rather than the goal itself. Uh, and And, that goes for all certifications, including the CTA, I think. Yeah, I think that's super advice. I think very valuable that indeed it should kind of grow almost organically, right? Exactly, yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you so much, Ariana, also for being here. And then, Ben, final words from you. And I think I'm going to echo that last point about not feeling like you have to go down the CTA path. And um, I think like a lot of people, when they they say to me that they want to be a CTA, they don't know why they want to be a CTA. Um, and it's just as if it's, oh, well, I, work, I, I want to be an architect. I work in the Salesforce ecosystem. I have to. But I've interviewed a lot of CTAs on my podcast and and the one, like the one thing I can tell you is um, I've never done it myself, but I know how hard it is and, and how much of a commitment it is. Um, and, and not just a commitment in, um, in study, but like it takes an impact on your family life and things like that. So you really do need a, a solid why um, to go through that journey. Um, and, uh, and it's absolutely fine for it not to be a goal of yours. And, um, and you can stick to one side of that, that, um, that triangle, the pyramid, or you, know, you don't have to do any of the pyramid if you don't want to. But if you do want to achieve the goal, make sure you know why and, um, and have that, that as a really clear vision, because otherwise... It's uh, going to be a long, long journey. Completely agree with that. So I want to thank you all again and all uh, people who attended and asked questions. It's been really insightful for me. I've seen a lot of people uh, having the same opinion as well in the chat. So 
thank you everyone for joining and um yeah this was a great session i was so happy <laughs> have a great thank evening great weekend thank you for having organizing it. and thank you for uh, uh, being part of this all of you great <laughs> have a good weekend good seeing you <laughs> bye-bye everyone have a nice weekend bye